what do you think about two self-described crazy Canadians who travel all around the world uncovering battlefield artifacts to then research and trace to the families that they might belong to? Filmmaker Wayne Abbott and Canadian historian and professor David O'Keefe have done just that. You probably have seen them or know of them from the breakthrough documentary Dieppe Uncovered, or perhaps you know them from Black Watch Air Ridge, which was what my first exposure to their stuff was. Regardless, you'll see them all over the History Channel in their television series called War Junk, which I can't stress enough is such a wonderful program. It's distributed all around the world in a ton of different languages. And I think the reason why it's such a successful show is because these two guys do meaningful research research, the tiniest little artifact that you would think nothing of, connecting real people to history, connecting the dots for so many families. That's what these two guys do, and it's really meaningful stuff. My name is Samantha. I'm the Outbound Operations Manager for the Battlefield Tours of Canada, and it looks like we've got a little bit more of a lockdown ahead. So what better time for us to connect with our wonderful community, both here in Canada and all around the world. Throughout this video, you'll see why we at the Battlefield Tours love this show so much. Watch this chat that I had with our good friend and award-winning Canadian historian, David O'Keefe. We were in the Shingmut. You've got to see that. It's in the film. I it's need to film. see it. No, I haven't seen well, it. Actually, we're in what is called the Shingmun Redoubt, which is the big fortifications built oh, by, yes. the, by the British north of Hong Kong in Kowloon. Yes. And it was supposed to you know, hold off the Japanese. And it was a series of strong points all in the mountains. And it's so cool because it's been turned into a park where you can hike now. But while they were building it, the British had a problem with some sort of insect or something. So they imported monkeys to deal with the insects. So now the monkeys inhabit this whole Shing Moon readout. So we go up there and um, we finish the, sh the shoot we need to do. And so I said, well, look, I'll go down, I'll meet our fixer and I'll get the lunch and I'll bring it up. And I just see in the distance about 500 yards ahead of me, the trees are shimmering like waves in this one area. And it's coming at me. And so now, I'm the buffet. They're coming at me. They're coming through the trees, right? And the big one comes right at me. And he grabs the bag out of my right hand. And I'm just looking at him. I'm like, and I just go flying up with the bags, right? And the guys are filming up above, and they don't know what's going on. And all they hear of me is, monkeys! And they're like, what? Monkeys! And I come flying up into the bunker and I throw the food into the bunker and the girl who's filming, Deanne, just catches all the food and she's standing there. <laughs> like she doesn't know what's going on. And so we, we sent the raw footage back to the, to the execs at History Television and we got, this, we got the show the next day. Well, oh, Hong Kong War Junk was an incredible adventure. Uh, and it started off, like I said, with an idea, and we just didn't know how to exploit the idea and how to really bring it to life. We yeah. just let Hong Kong tell the story. Yeah. We let the primary sources, the battlefield, tell the story. Yeah, that's right. You know? to watch the War Junk episodes because it's just so many of our friends. <laughs> I know. Yeah, you make some really good friends over the years. The other the other guy, him and his wife have become very good friends is Joel. Joel uh, up in uh, Absolutely. Stopples. Up in sure. Groningen. Yeah, yeah, they're they're great. I met Joel probably 5 or 6 years ago, I guess it was, on oh, another yeah. uh, Blackwatch snipers. Um, we had to go up to Groningen to do our recce and, you know, he took us through the recce and we met him. So that was about five years ago. And then we went back the following year, I guess it was, or the year after, I guess it was to do war junk up in Holland. And of course he worked with us the entire time. The yeah. other thing too, that I loved about working on war junk, um, is that Wayne has an incredible, uh, Wayne Abbott, who, you yeah. know, from war junk, yeah. um, just does a great job with picking our locations to stay. He just, he likes character and things, right? Whether it comes out yeah. in his filmmaking or whatever. So for instance, for the market garden, we rented two barges that yeah. were converted into hotels under the Nijmegen Bridge. That was just great. You wake up every morning, you're having coffee, looking up the Nijmegen Bridge going, wow. 
<laughs> you know? Yeah, well, was just I was going to ask, because you do, you do do some interviews when you're there on the boat. And it's That's like, right. are they on a boat? Whose yeah. boat is that? Oh, no, it was awesome. Phenomenal. It's converted into, yeah, converted into a bed and breakfast. And it was brilliant. We stayed in there. The entire, we took both of them because we had, uh, I think, nine people on the crew. Basically, we'd meet on deck every night, barbecues. And then you had breakfast in our, in our barge. Or the one I loved was the opening we did for the song, which we oh. found the place where Jeffrey Mallins yes. shot the opening. I, what I always thought was fascinating was standing there and you're looking at the photos and you're looking at the film exactly where he was. And then I thought, what would it have been like to be a German scout on the other side, mm. watching Mallins set up and trying to figure out what the hell is going, boom! <laughs> you know, that suddenly <laughs> her line goes up. Think about it from the other perspective, yeah. right? Your central figure in Dieppe. Oh, Matthew, who owns Les Arcades. Oh, Les Arcades okay. Hotel. <laughs> yeah, no, Matthew okay. has his finger in, in everything over there. <laughs> he sure does. Well, it was great because no, when we no. went over there, we met him. We just walked in. Just walked into his hotel and we explained to him and he was just like, oh, his eyes lit open, right? Yeah. And then we said, yeah, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find what was the Hotel Madère. Mm -hmm. uh, British intelligence thought it was here. And he goes, no, 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 no. He said, this has been Les Arcade for 100 years. And sure enough, he was on the phone in five seconds, and we were in the archives 10 seconds later. And he was just, you know, we found phone books, and we figured out it was actually the, the house across, or not the house, but the building, right across the street from him. So basically, it was the alternative target that British intelligence had discovered. Mm. They said about 70% it'll be in this building, and 30% it'll be in the other building. But either way, one of them is you know, one of them is Naval Headquarters. And then it was great. So we, we ended up staying in his hotel and we had dinner with him and then we did, you know, it was great, but he was fantastic because when we were filming, um, we were given the keys to the kingdom. Anything we wanted to do, there was no issues. They literally, we were given permission for the first time to film on location. Everybody yeah. was like cooperating, but I got to tell you this, this was funny. We were there on a Saturday. We we're getting tired and we've been filming for a while. And we have to do the assault scene that if the commandos get to their target, which is the hotel. So we had to film this. Exactly. So every 30 seconds, we were holding off traffic, filming the guy commandos running across the street, letting the traffic go. And it was, you know, we were in this rhythm. And then by the end of the day, people were starting to leave. And the reenactors are like, Ed, uh, you know, uh, I got to go there. They were funny. We had some Brits and we had some French reenactors and they were brilliant. Really, we're like, okay, we got this one last scene. We got to do it. And it's like five o'clock. And you know what it's like five o'clock in DF Harbor, right? Everybody's coming in. So Everyone's we're blocking down. off traffic. And just at that time, Mike Armstrong from Global National shows up to do a, a story about us. He start, they start filming and we're like, yeah, <laughs> you know, and then we look around. We have two guys dressed as Nazis directing traffic in Dieppe. <laughs> He's filming this, right? And then finally, he goes over and speaks to one of the uh, one of the ladies who was must have been in her eighties, and she ran. And she goes, "Oh, send the put the most over there." Not good memories. And then he interviewed some of the reenactors, and one of them was really funny. He said, "Yeah," he said, "I was walking down the street, and some lady threw a pot at me." So it was it was really interesting. Getting back to what we talked about about you know, the present and the past and, and, you know, how things change and sometimes how much they stay the same. There's always things that you're, you're going to come across that are extremely sobering. I was watching uh, the Operation Market Garden episode recently. Yeah. And, um, you know, we do this all that our my whole job is you meet people. Sometimes it's heartbreaking. You get these people that come forward and say like, you know, this was my dad yep. and I never saw his grave. And, that's yeah. what's so important is to is to make those connections you know but it doesn't get old and that that thing you had about um manning ha haney manning haney he's manning he's haney. oh i know the scrapbook jeez i can't not just burst out crying every time well yeah. have you seen the ones i put online it's called finding heroes it's it's sponsored by ancestry and okay. so we married up with Ancestry because we want people to start. Yes, yeah, so we okay. did five of them. So, you know, but the, the Manning Haney one was a riot because Jim Haney, who was there, after we sort of filled him in on what was happening, mm -hmm. and we did this over a couple of days, so we got a chance to, you know, know him, have dinner. Mm -hmm. He just kept calling me brother. Yeah, it was yeah. just brother, 
brother. Yeah. It was really, it was neat. It was neat. Yeah. And there's, so there is that spiritual end to all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, the connection that people have, I mean, I, when we first did this in Hong Kong, and I'm not sure if you've ever seen the Hong Kong episode, I've not seen the Hong Kong. Episode. That's the pilot episode. Really? And we went to Hong Kong with an idea and no, no idea how to pull it off. Wayne and I would go off and make documentaries. We made, you know, Secret War Files and Black Watch Massacre. Yes. And we always thought how interesting it would be to record the trouble we're getting into just trying to do the legitimate stuff. Well, he said, you know what? It's kind of like when I was in Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand years ago. He said, you would see all this war junk all over the place. You know, basically the old canisters that were dropped were now being used as huts. And, but I always argued that we should put junk in quotations because people don't understand that we're playing off of it. In other words, it appears to be junk, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we went to Hong Kong, and uh, I guess it was 2011, January. And so we went with an idea and no clue of how to bring this together. Mm -hmm. And so it all just came out kind of organically. Wayne went over there earlier on a recce, just before Christmas, and that's where he met Craig, who joined us. Um, and Craig's been, you know, digging as an amateur battlefield archaeologist for a while in the area. So we're looking through his collection. He's got everything from rifles and machine guns and everything else that he's discovered in the battlefield. And then we found this one tiny little artifact, which was just half of a shoulder flash, okay, from a Royal Army Medical Corps doctor. And, and we thought, okay, this has some promise because there were only like five doctors. Mm. in Hong Kong. So sure enough, we looked it all up. We found out what happened to them. And the one guy was uh, Barkley, I think it was. We narrowed it down to him. And we were pretty convinced that what we found came off his uniform. Um, likely because when I was researching Dieppe in London at the archives, Wayne was with me. So I called up uh, a file on Hong Kong, you know, casualties and whatever else. I said, here, do some Barkley research. And Christ, don't you know what the first bloody file that he finds is an atrocity report all about Barclay. Oh. Barclay and two other guys being taken prisoner by the Japanese, strapped to trees, whipped, tortured, and then they escape. And then what we discovered was the route that they escaped, they got about 100 yards away and then split up. The two guys who survived to be able to tell the tale went one way and Barkley went the other. We found that Army Medical Corps uh, shoulder flash about 500 yards down the line in the direction that Barkley went, and no other record whatsoever of any other Brit, let alone Medical Corps person being in that area. Well, it turns out Barkley was from New Zealand, yeah. and we ended up getting, finding out that his son was alive, a farmer, living in New Zealand. So we called, Two crazy Canadians calling, get this, calling him in the middle of the night to tell him we found something to do with the father who we find out he never knew because his father disappeared when he was four months old. Oh, wow. His mother and him were evacuated from Hong Kong when it looked like war was coming and he never saw his father. He was raised by a stepfather who married his mother after the war and that was his father. Wow. He knew that he had another biological father and everything... Um, about that father was in a, a chest up in the attic. So by this time, Jim was 70. Okay, Jim Barkley, the son, was okay. 70 years old. Okay. And so we called him, and it was like, two crazy Canadians want you to fly to Hong Kong. Well, his family thought it was some sort of bizarre kidnapping plot. <laughs> and, you know, so we finally had to send him a whole bunch of links, and he had to get into whatever. And finally, he's like, yeah. oh, hell with it, I'm going. He goes up into the chest, right? He's never looked at it before. Finds all the love letters between his parents and then finds photographs of them. And now he looks identical to his father. He looks like the 70 year old version of what his father would have looked like had he survived. You know, we show him the atrocity report. We're like, look, this is pretty tight, sensitive reading, you know, but we got to show it to you. It's, you know, the truth of what happened to your father. Yeah. And um, we said, here, here's the shoulder flash that we have. And he's like, oh, my God, this is quite something, you know. He said, you know, I, I want, really want to see his grave. And we're like, yeah, let's go. Let's go to the Saiwan Military Cemetery. So we go to Saiwan, and I, I look at Wayne. I'm like, Wayne, I'm just going to go into the cemetery, and I'm going to plot a route because we're filming this essentially live. Even though we don't go live, we film everything live, right, because we want that natural 
visceral reaction. We don't want to, there's no actors. So I go in and I realize there is no grave. Barkley was never found. So the only thing is his name on the wall. Memorial. So I came out and then that's suddenly when I, I thought, okay, I like war junk. I, I'm sold on war junk because that tiny little shoulder flash was the only little bit that connected Jim with his father. Other than that, it was just a name on the wall. And then we got attacked by monkeys. Terrible conditions to fight over there for the Canadians. 